Welcome to Door to Door Insider, where we take a deep dive into the mindset, the why, and the how of the industry's top entrepreneurs, leaders, recruiters, and salespeople. We are the Door to Door Nation. Here is your host, Lee Barber. Let's go. All right, gang, welcome to Door to Door Insider, Season 3, Episode 2. Today's special guest is Jordan Binning. Jordan started in the industry in 2008 with Vision Security. He was there for five years. Then he went on to a tenure at Vivint from 2012 to 2020. Jordan is currently the CEO of Rise Energy. Jordan, welcome to the show, man. Appreciate it, man. Grateful to be here. You've been on my goal list. <laughs> For like two years since the old, my old show, um, The Door Knocker. And I started at Vivint in 2017. And you were just always, um, I don't want to say ghost, but you were so far above my level as just a rookie door knocker. I started knocking when I was 41. I just always heard about you, but never saw you because you were just so busy doing the thing you yeah, know yeah. you're still at those levels so i appreciate you coming on brother no, it's a big it. deal no, i'm glad man so you you got a lot to talk about i'm not really going to roll with any notes on this because um i you know w from what i understand um and everybody that's super legit says you're one of the goats in the industry from accounts to recruiting to retention to the loyalty of your guys i mean you know i was talking to damien last night and he's like Jordan just has undying loyalty and love from his guys, which just tells me what kind of leader you are. I appreciate it. So a, a little bit um, about your your background, your childhood. Won't go too much into it, but just what was, where'd you grow up? What was that like? And what was kind of your entry into doors? Yeah, yeah, let's do it. Yeah, so I, I was actually born in Canada. I lived in Canada to the middle of eighth grade. Um, grew up in Seattle, went to high school there. Um, yeah. Went to high school there, I'm LDS, went on a mission, came back. Um, I played junior college baseball before my mission, went on my mission, came back. Where'd you do your mission? Uh, Toronto, Canada. Okay. Yeah, so went on my mission and, you know, I look back in that and I'm like, you know, that kind of set the groundwork of, you know, understanding a schedule, understanding who you want to be. You know, I kind of went on to my mission on, I was like, I'm going to be a chiropractor when I grow up. I kind of felt like I had like all these set goals. Mm -hmm. Went on a mission, came back, and you know, right when I came back, I'm like, hey, I want to be a sports agent. I'm going to go study law school. Um, played junior college baseball, tore my quad, and my buddy, he's still at Vivint, um, my buddy's brother was like, hey, come sell alarms. You can make 50 grand. <laughs> you know, at the time, I had $20 in my bank account. And I was like, dude, if I made five grand, this would be amazing. Yeah. Told my parents, super upset. Um, they did not want me to go. You know, like mm -hmm. you kind of live your whole life playing a sport, and your parents probably want to see that through. Yeah. But when I came back from my mission, it just like the passion wasn't there. You know, I, you know, on my mission, I learned, you know, business, life, go make money. You, you get older, you come back, you're like, you think a lot differently. And so when I came back, I'm like, dude, I want to go make money. I want to get ahead in life. I want to go, you know, kind of take everything I learned and go apply it. And I felt like playing baseball wasn't going to go get me there. And mm. to be honest, the love wasn't there. I wasn't nearly as good as before I left. You kind of lose a lot of skill sets, yeah. you know, along the way. And so I told my parents, I'm like, hey, I'm going to Chicago with my buddy. We're going to go. We're going to go sell alarms and I'm going to make 50 grand. Mm -hmm. And my mom, she was like, I'll be shocked if you make five grand. And, you know, this, this. Was the, this real quick? Was this with Vision? Yeah, it with was. Vision, with Vision. Got it. So recruited a couple buddies. We went out there. Um, I was the last person to sell in the office. And like, when I say that, like the office had 12 reps mm -hmm. and I blanked for three weeks. And you know, there's a point towards the end of those three weeks where I called my parents. I'm like, Hey, I want to like, this sucks. Mm -hmm. And cause this job is the greatest job in the world. When you sell, it's the worst job in the world when you're not selling. 100%. And I'm like, Hey, I'm not good. This job's terrible. Let me come home. My parents were pissed. They're like, no, you're not coming home. So they were upset that you were going, but once you had committed, yeah, yeah, it's like you, it's like you made in. that decision. You made the bed line it. Yeah, and, and after that phone call, that's when I kind of like you know reevaluated. Hey, I need two feet in. I need to burn my boats. I need to figure this thing out. And luckily, I did, and um, you know got a little better. Got a little better. I think my last month, I sold fifty. I ended what, up being the top rookie. What was the transition there, though? So because you know we see, and, and you have 
way more experienced in the game than I have. Yeah, but yeah. one of the things that we see is kind of a common thread is you'll have these guys come in and 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 they just kind of get it. Yeah. And you're like, oh wow, they just started selling right away. And then there's these other guys who have a week, two weeks, sometimes a month, two months lapse. Well, their mind is just trying to click through the chess match at the door, and some of them it kills them and they they quit, and some of them don't. What was the difference for you? Like what? What was it that flipped that switch? Um, I think the biggest thing you realize in this job is it's, it's a lot like you watch the Olympics when people run races. No one, no one talks about how they start. Mm. They only talk about how they finish. Mm. Finishing is worshipped, right? Mm. Like how you start is irrelevant. Mm. And I look at some of my best good, leaders today, yeah. and it's like, dude, I remember when they were rookies. Some started right away. They killed it. Some took three years to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, is when you see someone's pedigree, no, like no one talks about how they start. They just see where they're at now. Yeah. And I think it's important to remember that, dude, quitting is one of those qualities that lasts forever. Yeah. If you quit this job, you're quitting the next hard thing. Yeah. And then the next hard thing and the next hard thing. I think it's important to remember that no matter if you're just starting this job, the biggest mistake you can make is quitting. Yeah. And cause, cause this job is going to teach you who you are and it's going to teach you about the good, the bad, where you need to work, like how, like what areas you need to improve on, mm -hmm. especially year one. I think you learn a lot about yourself and your me your mental makeup. And it's funny, you see all these guys who are successful. I look at Seth, mm -hmm. your, your background as well, mm -hmm. right? And you know, people are like, you know, I started from nothing, I had to figure this out. I'm the opposite. Like my parents have always kind of been well off, but I don't remember a time where I ever had more than $20 in my bank account. My mm -hmm. parents never baby fed me, you know, say if I wanted money for the movies, I was working my ass off mowing the lawn. I was doing something to figure out how to go get money. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Well, it's grit can't be handed to you for sure. You earn grit, for you sure. earn tenacity. And so, you know, I agree with you. I, I love what you said. Um, the, the only way to fail in this job in my experience is to, is to, is to quit. Yeah. And, but what you, some people don't have the same level of grit as other people and they don't have the same level of maturity in their life, managing themselves and doing hard things and not always just doing whatever they feel like doing, but doing what they need to do when they don't feel like it. And sometimes that's what most of the time, that's what you're learning in that first year. Yep. So yeah, I vibe with that a lot, man. Yep. So yeah, year one, finish that year, top rookie. You know, at Vision, they were kind of smaller. And it just kind of opened my eyes because, you know, at the even at the end of that year, I was like, I'll never do this job again. This job sucks. <laughs> and I think I made like 36 grand year one. I felt like I was like Donald Trump. I went yeah. to school at BYU Hawaii. <laughs> and you realize 36 grand, you know, disappears quick. Really quick. And, you know, life life gets expensive when you start paying for everything. Life gets lifey. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so the next year, I just recruited some buddies, went out. I managed, you know, quote, unquote, managed my first year. Um, brought 16 buddies out. None of them, they're all my high school buddies. None of them made it to August. Mm. And, um, you know, because I think this job's one of those things where you go through different stages. So you can go be a really good rep, mm -hmm. but then you become a leader and you're a manager and you're a really bad manager mm -hmm. and you got to go figure out managing. Mm -hmm. And then you, you know, become a good manager. Then you become a regional manager and you're a bad regional manager. Mm -hmm. And so every step along the way, you got to figure out how to go reinvent yourself. Mm -hmm. You got to figure out who you are. And this job literally is about reinventing yourself, reinventing yourself and reinventing yourself. And me. it's, it's all about progressing. And I think for me, I, every step of the way I look back, I feel bad for the guys that were in my office in 2019. There's still mm -hmm. some of my best friends today from, mm -hmm. you know, to this day that I went to high school with. And I feel bad because I, I now look back and I was like, dude, I was a terrible manager. I had no clue what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, that's just, it's just the funny part of this job is you kind of figure out along the way what I'm good at, what I'm not good at, where I need to improve. And it's about making those adjustments as quick as possible to go bridge those gaps. I think it's that combined with the awareness of knowing what you don't know. Yeah. I think that some people um, don't have the humility to check into those lessons. And sure. you see people where they just kind of marinate at that same level. You know, I've gone through, um, I love what you're saying because I've gone through evolutions of my career you know, it is, it's first you learn how to knock, then you learn how to close and you, you know, and you recruit a guy and you totally trash him because you don't want to like, you don't know what to do with him. You don't, yep. can't take his phone calls and then you learn how to manage and eventually you learn how to lead. But each one, like, I mean, the emotional and spiritual stuff for me and just different levels of emotional maturity are some of the things that have made me so much better in the last six years as I started to develop them personally because they were weaknesses. Yep. But by being humble and like going through them and not quitting on them and not quitting on myself and other people, I've developed more. So I, I really value what you're saying. Yep. So, 
So I was at Vision for five years and I kind of got to a point where I felt like, you know, I, I, I always tell people this, this job's the closest thing to sports without playing sports. Mm -hmm. Super competitive, hyper-focused, go, 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 cutthroat. And, um, you know, I kind of got to a point where I felt like I was no longer progressing. I was the top manager, top rep, and I felt like I needed to go to a different arena to mm -hmm. go elevate my game to the next level. Vivint, I lived in Hawaii, so it's not like I'm in the Utah scene. I don't really know much about anything. I had met Scott and Jason Brown um, years prior. They tried to recruit me every year. And Vivint was one of those things where it's like, it's kind of like, if you don't play for the Lakers, you hate the Lakers. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, dude, I'll never work for Vivint. You know how it is. You start 100%. at a small arm company, you hate yeah. Vivint. They and just talk shit about them all the time. 100%. That's and and what's funny is I remember going to a, getting recruited the year prior at Vivint. Didn't, I think I signed, but I never went there. And I remember this kid, he said, oh, I heard you sold 400, da, 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 da. He's like, yeah, that means nothing unless you can do it here. And I was like, okay. Like <laughs> they felt like they were on this whole different level. And I said, you know, it kind of got me. And I'm like, okay, cool. And it's like I said, it's a lot like sports. You know, mm -hmm. if you could play for Alabama, go play for Alabama. Yeah. And that next year, Blackstone had bought Vivint and yeah, basically kind of headhunted all these top dudes outside of the outside of Vivint to go there. Mm -hmm. And I went there, sold 450 my first year, you know, took that number one spot. And it made me realize that no matter where you are, the cream will always rise to the top. Correct. And Vivint, well, one of those things where I was like, I'm going to go for a year and if it sucks, I'm out. And honestly, I loved it. I, I loved it because there was a lot of people better than me. And it made me realize how much more I needed to improve to get to the next step. Because mm -hmm. I think the longer you do this job, you realize that selling is just a fraction of like the overall picture. I agree. You got to be really good at selling to go obviously make money to go lead people and go attract people. Mm -hmm. But you also need selling is just a, it's a fraction. Mm -hmm. And then you got to how do you become a good leader? How do you inspire people? How do you retain people? How do you, you know, have a culture of winners that produces greatness? Like there's all these things that factor in. And I felt like going to Vivint opened my eyes on, hey, dude, I could be so much more. Mm. And so I really appreciated my time, especially even early on. Obviously, you know, it's, it was a roller coaster along mm -hmm. the way. But like I look back and I'm like, dude, I'm super, super grateful for it. So, so year one, you come in and do four. Yeah, like 450. Like 450. Yep. Is it just Jordan? Did you bring some guys with no, you? No, I came with 15 look? dudes. What's funny, of those 15 dudes, 12 of them still work with me today. Really? Yeah. And it's funny. I that like, honestly says a lot about yeah, the person who they it, are. It is funny, man. It's funny. Like, I I don't know. I, I, I can look at, like, my career. My career's been very in your face. It's been abrasive. And I think the biggest thing you realize, like, as a leader – you get all the praise, you take all the bullets. Yep. And if you don't want to sign up for either, don't be a leader. Yep. And I think as a leader, I realized even early on when I first came to Vivint, I'm like, hey, you know, I have 15 guys. Fast forward seven years, we had 300 guys doing 35,000 accounts. Mm -hmm. And I look at those guys today and they all, you know, all make millions of dollars. They manage guys, they manage regions. And it's like, I think a lot of times, like you look at your group that you have now and you never realize, you don't think 10 years ahead. Mm -hmm. You don't think, what does this look like in five years? What does this look like in 10 years? So yeah, I came with, you know, 15 dudes, 11 to 12 of them are still with me today. And I look at those dudes and I think, you know, every time you go to a different arena, like I said, you go play at Salt Lake Community College, you go show up and play for Duke, your eyes are going to be open. Okay. Mm -hmm. I got a lot, of, you know, I can improve in a lot of ways and I can go get better, but you surround yourself with top talent naturally you're going to become top talent so this is something that that really intrigues me as a student in the game like there's just you know where i've developed as a professional is like one of the one of the most dangerous places i can be as a professional is in a, is in a fucking rabbit hole yeah, yeah. thinking of where things are better why someone's this and that and what i've really realized is that the strongest organizations are built off of loyalty to each other as friends no matter and, and the reason that i say rabbit holes is because you know we worked if we work together yeah a year from now you can do something that i don't agree with and i can go all the way down a rabbit hole and then mf you all the way to the end of the street and then eventually i don't want to work with you anymore but when you have loyalty in friendships and partnerships i mean we'll talk later about what you guys are all doing now together yeah, but yeah. having those relationships like how did that affect, um, because what intrigues me is I've gotten older in the industry is how guys recruit and do so much. And what I realized is it's, it's, it's true leadership, right? So leadership is influence. And the more influence you have, 
but it's also the loyalty of those relationships where people, you know, because what, what guys will do is they say, oh, I'm going to go down this rabbit hole and then I'm going to go get 10 cents over here. And then they tank, right? And where if they just would have watered the grass where they were. And when you look at some, you know, and I want to hear your story, but when you look at like Casey and Bodie and Pop, those guys had a long relationship together and yeah, they, yeah. they built the shit out of that thing. Yeah. And they had... Every day wasn't a great day. For sure. You know, so, and I want to hear that story about, but what was that initial few years like for you and your guys, your core guys, and building what you built in? I mean, you guys were doing 35, it's, it's a lot, 35,000, yeah, yeah. it's huge. Like, how, how did that affect those first couple of years for you guys? What was that like? I, I think it's understanding that, like, you as a leader, you got to go paint a bigger vision for your people. Mm -hmm. And I remember, like, CJ, we were in Mexico a couple months ago for our, our company retreat and CJ was talking and he was kind of talking about like the turning point for him and his career. And, and he brought up a conversation that, you know, it, I, I didn't really remember. And he was like, he, he, he was like, dude, Jordan sat me down and said, dude, you're a 300 account rep. Mm. Then, and then he's like the next year I went from selling 150 to 300. Mm. And I think a lot of it, it's, it's you as a leader, you got to go paint that picture. You got to go increase your people's vision. And mm -hmm. if you have 10 reps, here's what people don't realize is this. If you're managing five reps, it's the same as managing 10 reps, 50 reps, a hundred reps, you're managing a system. Mm -hmm. And I think being a leader, it's like, dude, you read any book and I, I'm crazy, man. Like I read, like, I want to be Alexander the great, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like I want, I want to <laughs> be, I want people to know like this dude's scared of no one yeah. and I'm following this dude. And when, when people always say your dudes are super loyal, it's, and, and maybe I got lucky. I don't, I don't think it's anything I do. I think we just know together we can, one plus one equals five. Yeah. It doesn't equal two, yeah. you know? And I think, I think for me as a leader, I try and there's a few things like principles I follow. Can I help my guys make more money year over year? Mm -hmm. I also want to go to bed at night knowing that my guys are in the best possible situation to make the most amount of money. Mm -hmm. And if you're a leader and you can't say that, dude, you're in the wrong spot. You're yeah. in the wrong system. And so for me, it's like, can I progress them in leadership year over year? Can I help them make more money year over year? And I think for us, like even when we walked into Vivint, we never thought it would turn out to be the way it did and go do, you know, 30,000 plus accounts. So never once. But what did you, that, what did that look like for you guys though? In what sense? I mean, so you guys start to build that type of volume. How does that momentum build? And then, you know, the recruiting, just the whole, the whole thing. I mean, how, what was your best year? Um, Volume wise, yeah, around thirty five thousand accounts. I mean, that's a massive amount. But a lot of it was hanging out with Jason Brown, hanging out with Casey Ball, and them picking their brains. Bo Mendes asking mm. those dudes questions. Like, I think the best people ask questions. Yeah. The best leaders ask questions. They're always figuring out how to go get to the next step. And I remember working out with Casey. He was like, "Hey, you got to have your people go wear the next hat now." And so I did like thirty four hundred accounts, one office in Colorado Springs. There was like thirty of us. From that office, 16 guys managed teams today for me or regions. Yeah. And I look at that. We went from one office the next year, 2015, we went to five or six offices. And so it was really that year where it's like, no, you're a leader. You want more money? You're going to go run your own team. You got to wear the bigger hat now. Even if you're not ready, you got to go do it. And they all stepped up. Yeah. I think a lot of times you realize you let them go wear the bigger hat. Your people are going to step up. People want to feel like this is theirs and they're not working for someone else. So you yeah. got to go promote them. You got to go put them in situations they're a little uncomfortable with. They're going to think bigger. They're going to do more. They're going to have bigger vision. They're going to be more bought in mm. and the results are going to be better. That's amazing, man. So, I mean, you mentioned, you know, working with Casey and some of these guys, um, obviously you were with Todd. What, what, what were those like, those years like for you? I'm always interested. So and it's always interesting for me because when, when I, I started in 2017, yeah, yeah. I was 41, um, and I was just, I'm just a door knocker. Then, yeah. You know, and Todd would fly, and I see all these dudes, and I kind of watch and see what they do. Um, but they're still inspirational people to me. Um, you know, what, what did some of those relationships do? What did you learn in those for volume, leadership, personal management, personal development? Um, from that circle of people, what were some of like your main takeaways that, that helped perpetuate or excel you to where you are? Um, and, and I mean, as you know, like there's been highs and high, like the highest of highs and lowest of lows. Yeah. And it's kind of what I said earlier, like as a leader, it's like, I think the biggest thing I realized is I signed up for this. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like people always ask like, man, you, you've gone through so much and this and that. And it's like, I signed up for this. Yeah. 
I took bullets for guys that made mistakes. I've made mistakes. And I think as a leader, like you're going to, you're not going to be perfect. Yeah. Everyone's made mistakes. Some get more publicized than others. Um, I think the biggest thing I learned obviously from Casey and Jason is just that is how do you go promote your people? How do you think bigger case Casey's a visionary? He is, yeah. You know, Mendez, how do you learn systems? Bo, I learned how do you go, you know, budget money, Scott Brown, one of the best recruiters in the game. Cody system. And so it's like all these guys, I feel like I was just surrounded by dudes that were a lot better than me. And it helped me realize that they're no different than me. I think that's the biggest thing. My takeaway that I tell everyone, Mm -hmm. I can do it. You can do it. If you can do it, they can do it. Casey can do it. You can do it. And I think a lot of times you realize, dude, this job's not rocket science. This job's (laughs) not, doesn't take the smartest of smarts or the best looking dude. It's whoever's like, I'm willing to die on a treadmill. Yeah. Like I look at Will Smith. He said, yep. the dude that works the hardest wins. Yep. And I think that's what this job is, is people like, it's like, dude, I'm people want to kill you and you get back up. You keep going with a smile on your face. Okay. And I think a lot of it's having perspective. And like I said, dude, my career has been crazy, man. There's been highs, the highs, lows, the lows, um, you know, very abrasive, so, but, but real quick on, yeah. on that topic is, dude, I think if you threw your problems in a circle, you'd pick your own problems. Mm. And I look at my life, dude, my life, I have a beautiful family, beautiful wife. I have friends that'll take bullets for me. Mm. We're thriving. Life's amazing. And I think, uh, I think you learn a lot about yourself in the 10 to 12 dark days. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You don't learn anything about yourself when life's good. No, you, don't. you learn about who you are when it's like you've been socked in your face. You're on the ground. You got to figure out, am I getting back up or am I folding? Yeah. And I always tell everyone, I say, yeah, career wise, I probably survived things that most people couldn't survive. Um, at the end of the day, I'm grateful for it, man. It's yeah. gotten me where I'm at and I've learned a lot through, through the process. Yeah. So you had some notes. Um, Is there anything? I want to let you take a look at those and see if there's anything specific um, because I don't want to miss anything that you want to talk about. I want to talk about some of the highs and highs and the lows with with the Vivid um, because, you know, I know that a lot of people want to talk about it. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's like uh, I heard um, I've heard a lot of different things. um, And like we talked about before the show, I've never heard anybody say anything bad about you. I think that what happens in a lot of situations is people are going to do what's best for them. And like you said, you don't want to beat a dead horse for this, but I I've gone through, you know, things in my career on a much smaller scale yeah, yeah. where people are talking shit. Um, and you know, this is what it, it, whenever you're like, if they're not talking shit about you, you're probably not doing enough. And that sounds I, I, cliche. I, no, I agree with that. But it's like they, you're, they, they see you climbing up and, and you got to take a fucking knee because <laughs> it happens. For sure. And then they want to crucify you and talk, pull you down and like do all this shit. So, you know, you had, um, but this is the thing. When you're doing 35,000 accounts, there's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of money. There's a lot of emotions and and. You know, I, I've said this before. One of the things I, 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 I kind of despise is saying that this industry isn't personal. Yeah. Because when, when you're on the battlefield with somebody, like those 12 dudes that you've got with you, sure. that's a personal relationship, man. For the sure. relationship you have with Casey and those, this personal relationship. So uh, if you want to talk about some of the highs and the lows there and how you persevered and, like, what, what it taught you about yourself and other people. Yeah, I think... Dude, I, I, I think I made the decision that, dude, you can be bitter, you can be better, mm. and I want to be better. Mm. You know, you know what I mean. People always ask me, like, dude, how do how how do you survive? Like, this guy said this, and like, I don't know that guy. He's not saying that to my face. I know yeah. that. You yeah, know what I mean? Exactly. And and so it's like I'm surrounded by dudes that'll take bullets for me because yeah. they know I'll take bullets for them. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I got a beautiful family. Beautiful. Like my life's good, and. Like I said, if you put your problems in the middle, you probably pick your own problems. Yeah. Like, yeah, my career's been a wild ride for sure. And, dude, I'm not saying I'm perfect. I'm, I've for sure made mistakes. I've taken bullets for some of my best friends that I have no regret taking them for, Yeah, to be honest. Yeah. You know what I mean? And Well, it's easy to say you'll take a bullet, and it's a different thing to take uh, it. Yeah, and guess what? Like the man who actually takes then it. Then they take bullets for me. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and so, like, I look at it, and it's like – Corporate America is corporate America. Yeah. You know what I mean? And we could kind of leave it at that. And I tell everyone, if you're going to sell alarms, I'm dude, I'm not bitter at Vivid. Some of my best friends still work there. I tell everyone, if you're going to do alarms, go do it at Vivid. Yeah. Best, like, it, it was awesome. It's the bud. If you're going to sell solar, you probably don't go sell solar for an alarm company. That's just my opinion. Maybe I'm wrong. No, you know what I mean? I agree with you. I think I'm right, but maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. Um, and so that that's my advice is is I just, I, I made the decision. I just, 
why be bitter? You know what I mean? I've, I've had friends that gone through the same stuff even there yeah. and they're bitter. And I saw how it consumed their life. And dude, 98% of my time there was awesome. Yeah. And 90% of the people there, I'm still boys with. Yeah. I still like, right there's there. some that I don't care. And to talk to every, and we're good. My thing is this, in the dark days, you learn who's your friend, who's not your friend. Mm. You learn who sees that, you learn who see um, who wants to win, well, wants to see you win, and who doesn't want to see you win. Yeah. And I think you realize they love you until you're gone. You know mm. what I mean? You can be the poster boy one day, and you can get your head cut off the next. Mm. That's corporate America. That happens. That doesn't happen to them. That happens mm. everywhere. That happens to Steve Jobs. That happened everywhere. Everywhere. And you know, my whole thing with Todd is, I look up to Todd. Todd knows it. Mm. We've we've kind of hashed things out. Like Todd's the goat. Mm. And. I would be a dumbass to say anything otherwise. Mm -hmm. You know, you know what I mean. Thank so you. it's like um, he's the man, and yeah. I learned so much from him, and I learned so much from my leaders. Who some of them got their heads cut off. That's just part of the game. I wasn't going to stay there until I was sixty. Yeah. Neither were you. Yeah, yeah. And hopefully, neither <laughs> anyone there selling shouldn't stay there till they're sixty. Yeah. Life's about progressing. Life's yeah. about figuring out this is a stepping stone onto the next. Yeah. And that's why for me, it's like, dude, I just want to be better. I don't want to be bitter. Yeah. I, I, I don't want to wake up and consume my life. I can't believe they did this to me. I was 34 at the time, maybe 35, 34. And I'm like, I got, I got years. I got years. <laughs> I got an art. I got dudes whose family are depending on me to go make the right decision. Yeah. And I'm going to figure it out. You know, what's, what's been interesting for me, I've only been in the industry for six years was that was one of the and i spoke about this in one of my last podcasts with kim that's one of the biggest spiritual things that i went through and you know when you talk about earlier in the podcast when you're talking about like progressing as a human being you know i remember moments of like kicking and screaming and bitching and complaining and rabbit hole when shit wasn't going my way or people were doing this and that and it's like but you have to go through that and then to to get better and to progress as a human being for sure and then eventually your paradigm changes into this and i hold the same paradigm you, you do that it's like listen first of all um it, it's it, it is students don't always stay with teachers um and some you know sometimes they're in organizations where they can progress and sometimes they're not um, sometimes they get what they need and they stay and sometimes they get what they need and they go that's that's on them and that's got to be okay right it's and it, what they do is not my problem what i do is my problem sure um and if i won't go to you for advice I'm not going to take criticism for you. That's really where I've come to. It's like, and, and, and it's pretty dope to hear you say this because, you know, I, I know what I've heard, but I understand the size of those organizations and I understand the size of, of that, those emotions that you were going through at those times and to come out, ultimately coming out on top is being okay. Yeah. And so like, you know, I've gone through these little roller coasters. You're up here going through these you're on an amusement park ride right, oh, yeah. of like emotions, Not you know six what I mean? Flags. Yeah, so it's 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 a different set. So to get that paradigm from you is like, I mean, I I, I that's just a shout out for everybody. That's dope shit. It's like, don't be don't be better, be better. One hundred percent. That's a huge takeaway. Yeah, I think it's uh, this won't be the last, right? Like hard hard things, bad things, unexpected things are going to happen, and I think you got to make the decision that no matter what comes your way, you'll figure it out, mm -hmm. and. There'll be rough times. There's sleepless nights. There was for me. Yeah. Um, and I don't think we have everything figured out, but I think we're doing really, really well. Yeah. And um, I think at the end of the day, there's something rewarding knowing when dudes want to see you fail mm -hmm. and you don't fail. Mm -hmm. And I think this industry, I always say this industry is full of parrots. Even yeah. a parrot can talk. Yeah. You know what I mean? Go do it. Go do and it. performance is reality. Yeah. And that's like kind of motto I live by. You can say whatever you want. You're not saying, you won't say it in my face it. and performance is reality. You know what I mean? Go perform. I go be that. a big boy yeah. instead of talking, go produce. Yep. You know what I mean? I do. One of the, there's, you know, there's just things in this world that I despise. I hate, um, you know, in my world where I used to come from, we used to call them cell soldiers. Yeah. You know, when the door's locked or you're on social media behind a, a keyboard yeah, yeah. and you're safe. But ultimately if, if you won't say it, to my face it just says everything about who you are as a human being and says absolutely nothing about me yeah i think i think too is there's a quote by carl jung he said the world will what is that? i said the world will ask you who you are and if you don't know it will tell you mm. and i think for me it's like dude i know who i am yeah. i'm 100 percent confident with who i am i know what mistakes i've made i know what mistakes people say i made that i know i didn't make mm. And I don't care. You know, you know what I mean? You yeah. can talk all you want. You're not consuming my energy with stuff I don't care about. 
I'm focused on dominating, winning, building an organization for some dudes that I've rolled with for some over a decade. And I want to go from 300 reps to 900 reps like we did. And I want to keep going and yeah. keep winning and keep dominating. The, dude, people will always talk. I remember when I first switched to Vivint, they're like, oh, these guys, they're this, they're that. They're still talking. I don't care, dude. We're focused on bigger and better things, as, as, as should they be. You know what I mean? Yeah, but that's, that's the difference, though, is a lot of those dudes <clears throat> literally don't focus on bigger, better things. No. They're so focused. They still on, run one office. They've done it for 10 years. And they're focused and, on other people. 100%. Right? People talk like, yeah, yeah it, 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 and like I said, I, I, I made the decision. Like, I tell everyone, you can do alarms, go do it for Vivint. Mm -hmm. Dude, my time at Vivint was awesome. Yeah. There's obviously, yeah, yeah, like, you know, there's some craziness involved. Um, but dude, I made, I've learned from Harvard executives. I learned from best, of the best in class sales leaders. Yeah. I learned how corporate America works. Like, and if anyone has a right to probably be bitter, it's probably me, mm -hmm. but I don't care. I'm not going to be, I hope they dominate. Doesn't I'm confident you, yeah. in my ability to go dominate, even if they dominate, mm -hmm. because I believe that there's plenty of money in the world to go be made. And I hope they go make it. I hope we go make it. I hope you go make it. Mm. And I hope all of us go make it. That's I amazing. don't want to go win the race because seven dudes broke their leg. Yeah. I want to go win the race just like I used to tell Trevor Frank when I worked there. We're still buddies. Mm. I want to beat you at your best. Mm. You know what I mean? And I want you to beat me at my best. Did you beat him? A, a lot. Yeah. yeah. But he's, yeah. he's the man. He's, he's like, I love that beast, dude. Yeah. But it's like, I want to beat you at your best. Yeah. I don't want to win the race because everyone broke their leg. There's yeah. too many dudes like that in the industry. Yeah. They publicize your failures. Mm -hmm. But it's like, bro, I want to beat you at your best. Score 30, I want to score 35. Yeah. You know what I mean? I with that. Yeah. So tell me, so you go from um, alarms into solar um, with Vivint. What, what is that like for you in your organization? So you're taking, how many guys transition from, and I just know this, the sale is different, the knock is different, the timeline is different. Yeah. So like how many guys were with you it and was, what was like that transition like? Yeah, it was a wild time, man, if yeah. I'm being honest. Um, I say that because kind of back to what I mentioned earlier is they love you until you're gone. Yeah. And once you're gone and if they know you're a threat, mm -hmm. they, they, That's they will do whatever they can <laughs> to try and make you life hell. Yeah. And like I said, you know, those emotions have died down. It was a wild time in general. Um, and I also recognize things have, things were done in the past that caused the wild time. Yep. I don't think necessarily I did them, but maybe guys in my organization. And, um, I look at that and yeah, it was a wild time. And to be honest, like, I went a period of two to three months, same night, not nightmare, same dream, waking up the same time, 2.31 every day, literally three, three months in a row, um, sweating, like, I got to figure this out. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, pressure. I think for me, it was like, you know, ADT offered a lot of money, but I'm like, dude, I'd be a hypocrite. I loved Vivid. I loved the product. You know what I mean? I loved the alarms. Alarms was like the cool thing back then. Yeah. And I'm like, dude, I'm not doing ADT. I'm not doing this. I was mm -hmm. like, I'm going to go disrupt solar. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is I feel traditional solar. Everyone's a closer. I was transitioning, you know, guys that were 21, 19, 20, 21, that I felt like couldn't necessarily go knock on a door and close a 50 year old with a $60,000 loan. Mm -hmm. And nor did I want them to, because I don't think they would have had a lot of success. Yeah. So I'm like, how do I go disrupt solar? All set or closer, all leads guys focus on their most profitable skill set. Your most profitable skill set's closing. Can you prospect? 100%. So can I. But that's not our most profitable skill set. A setter, day one rookie, never done, never done door to door. They show up. Their only skill set's their work ethic. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to go build a system, all setter, closer, all leads, completely disrupt how solar sold. I want to shrink the time. I want to take everything we loved about alarms, competition, go, 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 selling 20 in a week. How do we go do it in solar with solar pay? Mm -hmm. And I feel like we're doing a good job of that. Yeah. Yeah. So you pioneered some of that. Um, what, it, it's funny. I have this story. Um, I don't know if you remember John Taylor from Vivint, but I, when I started, I left. I left Vivint. Um, I was with John doing alarms, and I went to Vivint Plus, and then I went and started my own dealer. Sweet. And so I, I didn't have. Um, if I'm honest with you, I don't think I had enough Vivint yet because I, I, I kind of, I would just went and got the machete out and chopped my way through the woods. Yeah. And I, I, you know, went and started talking to John a, a year later and he showed me this fucking setter program. And I was like, yeah. all I knew was this self gen shit. Yeah. And it was like, you know, it was like, um, trigonometry on a board. But once I understood, it was like, it was so simple. And I've yeah. had somebody ask you like, how could that have been complicated? This is what you do. And it's like, 
until you're put into it. So what, what I want to hear is like pioneering that, like what got your mind geared into that? Because somebody had a sh like, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it started, we, we always, even at Vivint, we had, you know, big alarm teams. We'd have CJ and a few others be the closers in those office and just close their accounts with solar. So mm. we kind of already did it on a very small scale. Mm. But at the same time, I'm, you know, guys are transitioning from being 400, 500 count alarm reps to now going sell a product they've never sold before. Mm -hmm. I did. I don't care how confident you are. People like you're scared. Yeah. You know what I mean? It you're is, selling yeah. something you've never sold before. It's, mm -hmm. it's a scary transition because yeah. I think guys and what I've realized through that process is um, life's about being a little scared. Yeah, you know what I mean? 100%. Life's about being a little, a little uncomfortable and not being comfortable not being like and that's what i've tried to tell these guys is like bro we're gonna go do this we're gonna figure it out they believe me or not and if you don't believe me stay there yeah we're good <laughs> you know what i mean mm -hmm. well, I'm gonna that. i'll figure it out i know that for a fact and i think for us it was yeah a lot of trial and error man like last year was our first full year doing solar we installed a little over seven thousand counts about 46 megawatts which is obviously awesome but the year before we started in May and it was a lot of adjusting. It's a lot of pivoting. It's a lot of making hard decisions, figuring out what works and what doesn't. I tell everyone like, you know, you learn a lot. You, you learn a lot in, in the hard times about, okay, are you quick on your feet? What works? What does not What decisions do you need to make? And I think now being on like the ownership side, it even made me have a, um, honestly more appreciation to Vivint. Obviously I'm, I'm pretty anti-corporate America, mm -hmm. but I also understand like, Hey, you have bad act bad apples, you get rid of them. Like, and I think sometimes when you're just on the sales side, I think sometimes, especially when I was there, you get caught up in this little bubble with limited downside, probably not crazy, massive upside, but you think you're a business operator. You're really not, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Yeah. You run sales, yep. you don't run a business, you don't run a P and L you don't like, if it's negative, you have no money. Like it's, so I, I feel like, you know, some sleepless nights, but it's been awesome. Mm. And we've come out on top and I think solar's in its infancy. I think it's just getting started. Yep. And I think the next 10 years is the greatest opportunity in door to door that there's ever been. Okay. So no, I agree with you. Um, that I, I think solar has, um, <laughs> at least a decade left, man. So you had a chance. One of the things I want to talk, I want to let you talk on some of your notes at some point. Um, I want to talk about doing 46 fucking megawatts in your first year. Yeah. yeah. Um, but from your notes, um, what, what else do you have in there? Because I, you know, this is, I don't know what I don't know, Jordan. For sure. For sure. And I don't, I don't know you. Yeah. Yeah. I just know that there's, um, there's, a, a, a just a, a ton of useful information in, in that head. So what do you, what do you got? Yeah. I think, uh, you know, cause people always ask like, Hey, well, you know, are you mad? Are you this or that? And I'm like, dude, hindsight's, they always say hindsight's undefeated. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, yeah, if I could go back, I probably would have made this decision different. I probably would have stayed at Vivint Solar. Like, but I look at where my life is now and I'm mm. like, it took this, this, and this to happen to get yeah. to this point. And dude, I get texts every night. Are you so glad we got fired? And, and, <laughs> and they didn't get fired. I did. Right. Yeah. So it's like, um, <laughs> but that just tells you who they are that when you got fired, they got fired. Yeah, hundred percent. I love that. I respect the shit out of that. Man. They're a bunch of wild dogs, but yeah. they also know like dude, we're in it. We're in it together. You know what I mean? Yeah. And um, there's strength in numbers, man. And I think, I think, like I said, hindsight's undefeated. And I think it's very easy to look back, no matter what's happened in your life, even outside of this job, and be like, yeah, I wish I didn't do this, this, and this. But you also need to realize, dude, ha life happens. Life happens for you, not to you. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And like that happened in my life for me to get to this point. And I think, um, you know, you talk about 46, you know, megawatts. I read a lot, man. I read a lot of like the, you know, the obstacles, the way I read a lot of like Malcolm Gladwell. If you, if you ever read David and Goliath by mm -hmm. Malcolm Gladwell, you're not change your life. It's, it's basically about misfits and underdogs and why underdogs win, why, why they win a lot. And there's a quote in there and it says, here's a set of advantages that have to do with material resources. And there's a set that have to do with the absence of material resources. And the reason underdogs win as often as they do is that the later is sometimes ever a bit equal to the former. Mm. And it's, so you're like, Hey, how did you do it? The mother of yeah, ingenuity. Yeah. Like, how did you do it? I, do, I had no other option. <laughs> you know what, what do you mean? I had no other option. I had 350 guys banking on me to make the right decision for their families, I had to figure it out. Mm. And I think I remember on my mission, I had our mission president stud 
I'm still super close with him this day. He, he was, we had a companion. They hated each other. And mm-hmm. I remember my mission president came over. It was like right in front of me. He was like, Elder City. He's like, when I lived in LA, he said the Armenian people, there's a bunch of Armenian people. And he's like, um, they have the lowest, it's arranged marriages and they have the lowest divorce rate out of like all other countries mm-hmm. and or all their, you know, I guess demographics. And, and he asked the guy like, Hey, why do they have the lowest divorce rates there? It's arranged marriages. And he's like, cause we make it work. We mm-hmm. figure it out. And that, and he basically was telling like, Hey, you and your companion need to figure this out. Yeah. This is, you guys can't stop and looking it, at quit as such an option. A hundred percent. And so it, it, that's always stuck with me. Cause it's like, yo, like what were the options? I had no reason. I had to figure it out. Mm. I made the decision. This is what we're going to, I'm going to go do solar. I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to disrupt the solar industry and we're going to go be the best of the best. Like we've always done. We're going to rise back to the top. And what people don't realize is time, time heals everything. Mm. Dude, no one talks about Tom Brady, um, cheating to flake gate. They don't, what do they talk about? He's the goat. He won all these super bowls. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so it goes back to, man, I've been on the highest of highs. I was the poster boy for this, that we won this, we won that. But dude, you like, I signed up for this. So you can't take that and then be like, man, my life sucks. Why me? Yeah. Whoa, me here to the bullets. I signed up for that. Yeah. So I got to be able to embrace the good. I also got to be able to embrace the bad. That's the big boy shit. hundred percent. Dude, tell me about these wild fucking dogs. Tell me. So listen, <laughs> here's, I say that students don't always stay with people and it's, you know, cause, cause they don't <clears throat> my, but I'm a fucking ride or die. I, um, I, I just am like, I'm, I'm loyal, man. And, you know, I will make choices that um, even if I don't agree with you and I love you, I don't I, I'm not with somebody blindly. But if I love them, I realize that um, every decision that they make is not going to be perfect and I'm going to fucking love them through it. And if I see an opportunity, I'm going to bring it to my brother instead of hoarding it and taking it and cutting out some other kind of way. And, and but so I want to hear about these this fucking yeah, pack of wild dogs you got. There's um. <laughs> You know, there's kind of two types of people, right? Yeah. People who are like that. Yeah. And people that think, oh, man, they're here. I'm going to go take their shoes. Yeah. And then they take the shoes and they realize, oh, you can't fill the shoes. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because I think sometimes we overestimate what it takes to fill the shoes. Yeah. And I think managing your friends is a unique skill set. Mm. And especially, like, I look at me and some of the best guys I work with, I worked with for a long time, and they're my best friends yeah. outside of work. And I think that's a skill set that it requires being, being humble, knowing that, Hey, I'm not going to be perfect. We don't disagree. I mean, we don't agree on everything. Mm. There's times we disagree, but it's not like in each other's face. It's like, Hey, I'm respectful. man. a lot of guys are smarter than me in a lot of different areas and they know my skill set. I know my strengths and I know theirs. And I think we, we all just come to the conclusion that, Hey, take one plus one equals five yep. us together. There's strength in numbers. Um, if, it, it, if you can play for Alabama, you play for Alabama. Mm-hmm. And we always told everyone, like, we're Alabama. You know what I mean? You're mm-hmm. going to come here. And, dude, there's some sad stories. This is the NFL. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like what uh, Dana White said. <clears throat> it's the NFL. You either make it here or you don't. don't you yeah. know what I mean? And if you don't, there's plenty of other people that will pick you up. Because yeah. some people get intimidated by greatness. Mm. And I think facing, like, when you go back to how did you guys come out and do this? Well, it's like the act of facing overwhelming odds Mm -hmm. usually produces greatness. Mm -hmm. It's just like pressure. It's either a diamond or it cracks. And I think you got to make up in your mind that I'm never cracking. No matter what comes my way, I'm not cracking. I'm going to figure it out. You know what I mean? Yeah. I love that. So, um, you guys go in this year was 40, 2022 was 40. So where were you at in 2021? So you get, you transition alarm solar 2021. Is that right? Yeah. We started about end of April. And was that with just kind of the same thing? Same thing. Yeah, was yeah, it yeah. with, you were out of Vivint or in Vivint? No, no. Out, out, out of Vivint. Vivint so ended 2020. Summer 2020. 2020. Yeah. And so you start rise. Tell me about rise. So I just heard you say rise to the top, rise to the occasion. Is yeah. that, is that the vibe of it? Yeah, essentially. Right. Rise yeah. out of the ashes. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think, um, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, it's, there's a lot that goes behind the story at the end of the day, be the story. You know what I mean? It's yeah. people talk, people that know us, Oh, we'll figure it out. You know, cause in it, like you figure it out. And so it's for us, it's, yeah, it's, it's right. No matter what happens, you can rise up yeah. and life's not supposed to be easy, man. Life's supposed to be a challenge in different obstacles. Like I have friends that have gone through crazy stuff, not necessarily work-wise, 
And I think sometimes my stuff gets highlighted because it's career wise, it's work wise. Mm -hmm. The rest of my life's awesome. You know what I mean? So it's like, <laughs> bro, sometimes you got to face the pain. You got to face the music. This is getting embarrassing for sure. Like, it's like if my guys that know me know me. That's probably why 300 dudes walked out the door. Yeah. I didn't text them. Yeah. You know, I think they went through that. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and it's turned into 900. And people don't follow bad people, man. And, I agree with that. and you know, I, I feel like I, I don't have Instagram. I don't have social media. I have Facebook to keep in touch with people from my mission and like the six year old grandmas. I've never had Instagram, never had Snapchat. Yep. I just, I'm focused, man. I'm focused on dominating, winning, providing a system. I don't know if you watch basketball, but you know, I look at like Andrew Wiggins. He plays for the Warriors. Five years ago, I'll send you the article. Five years ago, Andrew Wiggins considered biggest bust in the NBA, number one pick. And he played for the Cavs. Gets traded, goes to the Warriors. NBA All-Star, um, NBA Championship. What happened? Same dude. Right coach, right system, right leadership. The mm. system that you're in matters. Mm. And so, like, I even look at people like Vivint. It's like, dude, my time at Vivint was awesome. We grew. We dominated. Just yeah. like at Vision, it was awesome. We grew. We dominated. That's not everyone's story at both those places. And so, I think a lot of it as a leader is how do you go create a system that produces greatness? Mm. And so, why these guys are loyal they're not blind. Like they're not, they don't fall blindly. Like, no. you know I mean, what I mean? They can't not with, with that level of loyalty, you, people, it can't be blind. No, it's, it's, they know if they're in the system, they're going to go produce They're Draymond green. Mm. They're not going to Draymond green's not going to go to any other NBA team and ever be an NBA all-star. Mm. Why is he on the warriors? Right system, right coach, right leadership. It helps him elevate his game to go perform on a level. He wouldn't perform anywhere else. Mm. And so when you talk about, Hey, what am I trying to create? I'm trying to create that. That's what I've always tried to create. And so why do people follow? It's because they know if they're in that system, life's not going to be perfect. There's going to be hard times. There's going to be difficult times. There's going to be sad stories. But the end result is usually you're going to go perform and produce and make more money than you did the year before. And ultimately, that's why you work. Yeah. So it, it's interesting that you say that because, um, you know, I'm, I'm with Legacy and Legacy's not perfect. Yeah, yeah. They're just not. But what, what I choose to focus on as a leader is what I get the most of. It just, let me adjust this a little bit. It just is. And so I, I love what you said. I think these, these people, the, the best way I heard it explained was, um, was it's, it's almost like, you know, when you're looking for um, a, a woman and you want, it's the perfect woman and she cooks and she cleans and she, she but she's a lawyer and she's super well read and she's got an MBA and she makes a million dollars and she'd be a great mother. It's yeah. like, it's not, you're not going to go anywhere in life and find these perfect scenarios. Um, you're not going to find the perfect solar company. You're not going to find the perfect systems. You're not going to find the perfect pay structure. It's like, you know, people are looking for, it's, it's a really immature way to look at what you want for growth because growth is, Good, good leadership, first of all. People yep. who um, are committed to the process, to the program, to the people, they lead through servitude, like what's best for my people. And then can they create the best processes and platforms for growth? And yep. whether that's a rise or a legacy or, I mean, you name it, is like, and it's what you said. Are you in the right boat with the right people that have the right things? And yep. what I see is that people go through I, you know, I, I, if I'm honest with you, I just think rabbit holes are bitch shit. Like sure. if you're focused on going down, if, if you're always looking for something that's wrong, you need to fix your mind yep. because that's not, you're never going to be successful. I, I could do that with my wife. Yep. I can name 10 things that I don't like yep. or a hundred things that I absolutely love. But if I focus on the 10 things I don't like, I can end up getting divorced. Yep. And so what, what's your experience with that? Like, cause you see it on a bigger, what, how many guys you have in the organization? 900? About 900 now. Yeah. Fucking be shit. And yeah. you did how many? 40 what? Last, last year, 46 megawatts. I mean, congrats, congratulations on that. <laughs> That's that. dope, dude. <laughs> so how, you know, how do you, how do you manage those expectations on, of guys on that type of culture? Because you're, you're satellite, yeah. right? You're, mm -hmm. you're, I mean, obviously you walk amongst people, but you're satellite view. So, and you're creating that vision, like you said. Yeah, I think a, I think a lot of that goes back to what's the standard, man. You know what I mean? Like mm. for us, it's like I want the standard here, and and for everyone, this isn't like they don't fit in that environment. Not everyone can play for Alabama. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, and and if you can't, and you want to go be the the big fish somewhere else, be my guest. Yeah, you know what I mean. I have a history of seeing how that hasn't worked out for certain people <laughs> yeah. that have tried that and yeah. they come crawling back. Yeah, you know what I mean. 
And and I think for me is I want everyone. I tell everyone like, like we find out. Oh, I'm looking here. I'm like shop around. I want you to. Yeah. You know, I think the best guys do it. Go yeah. ahead. But um, what's on paper doesn't translate to what hits your bank account. That's right. And I think there's so many intangibles that you can't quantify necessarily right off the bat leadership structure system competitions talent vision all those things mm -hmm. directly affect what hits your bank account because mm -hmm. it's gonna it, it directly affects your discipline your motivation like what you're thinking about what you're reading and all those things ultimately is gonna affect your 1099 at the end of the year mm -hmm. not what your red line is red lines are irrelevant yeah they're it's such a naive it's such a goofy, naive way to look at, it. and it's like, listen. And here's what I think. And here's what I think. if you want to go do five accounts or ten accounts or twenty, like, yeah, go go over there, chase your chase For your sure. red line, have it. For sure. But what you what people don't understand is they don't understand the growth potentials and the intangibles that are in the difference in those red lines, and ultimately this thing is is scale. And the way that you scale is, you know, in individual in each person. There's an ecosystem of how they feel about the culture and the culture is how the team moves how the organization moves how the leaders act how the leaders react how they win together how they lose together how they operate when shit's hard that's the actual culture and when you're bled into a culture like that right be in and you move out of this this thought process of just being a knocker and a closer and you're like okay, well, at some point I have to recruit and manage humans. And then some point I have to recruit and, and manage managers. And then I have to lead and to lead and to sell in recruiting. You have to be bought into a system at a hundred percent and you have to believe that you can help other people scale. And that belief system, that ecosystem is that, um, more elevated mentality in the industry and that's what you're speaking of yeah. and it's people they just know that if they're with you you're gonna win and it's not coming with a two dollar red line because that shit's that shit's for the birds and that's <laughs> yeah. and the, all the people with those they're not making that those are not the people that i'm chasing because one i'm, I'm not chasing I, I love money for sure I, i'm chasing who you are as a person like well shit if jordan can have 900 dudes like you've obviously been in the industry a lot longer than me but i look at those things as achievable things like if, if i stick should. around for six or seven more years yeah. me too like why can't i and that's what i'm chasing and it doesn't come with a two dollar red line no and and i i think what you said spot on and i fully believe that if i can do it you can do it and i look at you know, kind of what we've created is, hey, how do you go create a system where guys are making more money year over year? Yep. As a leader, you got to think the top, these are guys that are, you know, we go to like, they're my friends. And so I care about what do they make every year? Yeah. And so it's like, and, and that's what I talked about. It's the system, it's the structure. It's, it's all that's going to factor in to how much they make. And mm -hmm. I think I tell everyone this, I think humans greatest superpower is the ability to change. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something if you're listening to this, you got to think because you just talked about it, your ability to reinvent yourself and to change throughout the process in your career. It's how do you go from really good sales rep to recruiting to manager to regional to developing people to duplicating yourself? Mm -hmm. You know, that's that's what this job is. And that's what kind of gives me passion. I tell everyone I, when I worked at Vivint, worked at Vision, I told everyone I tell people today, maybe not the price tag is probably different today, but. I used to tell everyone, hey, if, if Boeing called me today and offered me 10 million bucks a year to sell airplanes, I would go sell airplanes. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> it's not strictly like, Vivint was just a platform. Vision was just a platform. Even Rise, maybe it's just a platform. Yeah. But the reality is, is I want a system where guys can plug in and go make phenomenal money, but I want it like the NFL. Mm -hmm. It's like, you gotta, sh to go make that, to go be recognized, you gotta be the best of the best. Mm. The guys who are the best in this job are the most consistent. They're not good for a week, they're not good for a month. They show up, they understand the inputs, the daily inputs every single day. This is what I gotta go to do to be the best. Mm. And they do it and they're consistent and consistent. It's the pebble in the shoe. Mm. And I think you gotta realize with this job is behind more mountains are more mountains. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> dude, like something's gonna come in your way tires gonna get flat you could validate excuses or you could choose to never validate excuses yeah. and you figure it out and i think for me and hopefully the guys i work with and i think a lot of them think like this is we just woke up and decided that no matter what comes our way we'll figure it out and i think that's important in this job this yeah. job's hard so you know one of my favorite sayings man is people people chase money right and i heard I mean, some somebody said it but it just always stuck with me it's like 
stop trying to make a million dollars and start learning to become the man who knows how to make a million dollars. And I remember looking back at my career, my first year I made 130, then I did 190, then I did 386, and then I did 750, and then I passed a million. And, but the money came with, one, just not quitting. Like I passed dudes up that were, I felt like were better than me in some areas just because they quit. Yeah. But also the lessons that I learned mentally, mentally, spiritually, physically, financially, the way that I learned to deal with people, the way that I learned to deal with myself dealing with people, I began to become a man who understood how to manufacture that type of volume. And so I, I love what you're saying because when I'm, and this is why I love the podcast is yeah. because I get inspired by people like you. I'm like, it, it is this thing. It's just understanding that if you just keep climbing the mountain and you just keep becoming the person and you just keep reinventing yourself and you just keep reading, keep listening, keep um, being a student, keep being um, inspired, keep humble, um, keep not fucking quitting. Yeah. Like you just become through the process, a man who learns how to, you know, first I was a man who knew, knew how to make a couple hundred and a million. And I'm looking at guys who are making three, four, five, six, ten, fifteen million dollars. Yep. And I can vision it. Like when I used to see Casey and he would tell his story of like, oh, when Blackstone bought Vivint, and I yeah, woke yeah. up one day and I was like, millionaire. And it seems so foreign. Yeah. But then, you know, as I started to learn Casey's story or guys like you's story, it's just a door knocker. Yeah. They're just stuck no in no different than you. Yeah, none. He just, just didn't quit. Just read more books because he's been in more longer. For sure. And didn't ever fucking quit. And he's yep. knocked more doors and done more shit. Yep. And so I, I love what you're saying, man. It's like just learn how to become the quit focusing. And this is just a shout to quit focusing on the fucking red line and yep. start paying attention to the guys who are making all of the waves in the industry who are putting in 45, 46 fucking megawatts and watch what they're doing and do that quit chasing the dollar and start chasing the man yep. that's like that's my sh that's my takeaway from that dude yeah and it's kind of what we were talking about earlier man is the guy that works the hardest wins yeah. and it's the guy in the arena you know what i mean it like is. everyone everyone has their opinion very few are in the trenches 100%. taking the bullets figuring it out and i look at you know even the guys i work with that are at the top is they're in the arena more yeah. they're in the arena longer than everyone else yeah. and they figure it out and they they know what they need to do to be successful. I think that's important. Yeah. And understanding each day, you know, what you read, what you listen to, when you work out, what time you start knocking, your follow, all that stuff's going to determine how much money you make. Mm. And it's not just, oh, my red line's this. That doesn't translate to what hits your bank account. Mm. You know what I mean? No. And I think to close, too, it's, um, you know, there's a quote by Malcolm Gladwell in that book, David and Goliath. I, I feel like I'm like the biggest sponsor of that book. Mainly because it's about overcoming adversity. It's yeah. about, hey, understanding that these are the odds you face. You've got to figure it out. And it's about inspirational stories of people figuring it out. Yeah. In the book, they talk about uh, one of the world wars. They're in, they're in London. I'll, I'll summarize it for you. Um, they're in London, and London's about to get bombed by Germany. Mm -hmm. in, in the book, they talk about, hey, London thought um, they're about to get bombed. They built all these psychiatric... Um, shelters for people because they're like dude we're gonna get decimated and throughout the process they get bombed for i think it's 57 straight nights they estimated six million people would die mm. um and it was, it was something crazy some crazy million yeah. number and what happens in the process 57 nights go by boom bombing after bombing after bombing i think it was forty thousand people died mm. and through the process they say hey divided getting bombed divided the people into three categories one the people that died two um, near, they called it near misses. Whereas, Hey, your brother died. Like someone you knew died cause of the bomb. Mm -hmm. And the third is kind of what the highlight in this chapter. They said they divided into the third category was they called it remote misses. You hear bombing for 57 days. You're, you're scared as hell. You wake up one day and you're like, Oh shit, I got bombed and I survived. Mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And I think for me, it's like, dude, I want to be a remote miss. Yeah. I want to know that it's like, dude, no matter what comes my way, I survived. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I'll yeah. figure it out. And I think that would be my advice. Anyone listening is, and then the, they summarize in the book and he basically says, courage is not something you have before the tough times start. Courage is something you have after you've been through the tough times and then you realize they're not that tough after all. Mm. And I think for me, it's always kind of hit home to me. It's like, dude, hard things are going to happen. How you embrace adversity is going to determine and it's going to tell you who you are. Yeah. And the world will ask you who you are. And if you don't know, it'll tell you. Yeah. So I would advise, figure out who you are, who you want to be, mm -hmm. how you want to lead, 
what you want to accomplish and don't let anything get in the way. Yeah. I love that, man. So that's, that was powerful, dude. Um, so listen, Jordan, I want to thank you for coming on, man. I have, um, a few of people who I consider to be goats have called you a goat. Well, um, it. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's been an honor, man. You're, you're the kind of man that, um, listen, I admire grit and I admire tenacity and I, I admire success through adversity. I admire loyalty. Um, I admire, I admire people who are, you know, mentally, spiritually, physically, financially just in the game and checked in, um, that, and just some of the stuff that you talked about, your people being with you, I don't give a shit what anybody says. When you got guys that are ride or die for that many years with you, that speaks precisely of your character and who you are. And those are the kind of things that, that I admire, man. So Thank how you. long have you been in the games? 2008? 2008, man. Man, I'm just trying to be like you, brother. Hey, you'll get there. You'll get there. <laughs> you'll get there. Yeah, I, I, I believe that I will. So um, it's been an honor. Likewise. Thank you for coming on the show, brother. Likewise. I All appreciate right. it, man. Thank right. you. Thank you.